look what I have. This is a Necky Mini Knitting Machine. I believe I'm saying that right. I looked it up with a pronunciation key on the internet, and that's what it came up with. It has its warranty card with it. So, when it didn't actually work, Jack said, we'll send in the warranty. But I think we're about 60 years too late, so we're going to have to do the work ourselves. Here's a few things that I wanted you to see that I know so far. These needles are in the locked in the back position. That's how it travels. And you get them there with a push back and up, sort of. It clicks into place rather hard, especially right now because the needles aren't in perfect shape. This one didn't want to go. This one did. And this one will go. So that is completely out of work. It's looking like this position is in work. And as with most knitting machines, this position is in hold. The carriage, which is not working now, would simply bypass them when it was working. This is what the underside of the carriage looks like. Let me change the angle so the light hits it better. Just the absolute last word in simplicity, but there is one thing that moves. That. I think its problems are at least threefold. There may be a little bend here that there's not supposed to be, and Jack's going to check that for me. Underneath here, there is supposed to be a sponge strip of some sort, and at this point, it is probably sponge dust, not a sponge strip. And also, the needles, somebody's worked on them a little bit in the past, you can see, but they had some rust on them, and it's not completely gone, so they're not real smooth sliders. And naturally, the machine is old and dry. It is not, however, very dirty, so I will work on what cleaning it needs. The speckles you see down in there sometimes when the light hits seem to be imperfections on the needles more than they are crud in the channels, but easy enough to clean them, both things out. So number one chore, undo these screws and have a look at that sponge strip and find a replacement. Here is why Jack is so useful to have around. I'm spinning and spinning and spinning and undoing these. And they're doing fine, but uh, this rail is not coming off. And Jack said, well, look on the underside. There's bound to be a nut in a little port. And voila! I don't know if I can get the light to fall on it where you can see the nuts down in there. There. There you go. There they are on the back rail. The same thing exists on the front rail, which is in these ports. So we'll get a little socket and get to work on those. Here Jack is going into the ports on the bottom with a socket and holding the screw from the top and releasing them that way. And there comes the hardware, which consists of a flat washer, a nut, and a bolt. Is that right? Yes, yes. And what size socket is working? This is a six millimeter, and I want to point out that you can see here that there's quite a bit of the shank of the screw sticking through. I'm trying to get it so I can see. There we go. No, that, there we go. Okay. So you, you must have a socket with a hole down the middle of it. Oh, so that shank can slide right. down the so hole. Right, so the shank can go inside the socket and fit over if the top. If you don't have a full set of mechanics tools, is this a hard thing to locate and where would you buy one? No, you can buy a six millimeter. I would get a deep socket because of these holes being farther down inside the machine. This is one of my favorite hand tools. It's actually a flexible extension for a quarter drive ratchet, but normally the knurling of the flexible shaft is enough to get a good little tight grip on. Yeah, these weren't in there down. especially tight, so yeah, they're at, never going at least on ours it was not a big deal to get it out. As the bar loosens, look what happens. All the needles come out. No disaster as long as they're contained on a table. I was going to take them out and work on them anyway. Now they've done taking themselves out. Okay, in there you can see in the track the pitiful remains of the sponge bar. It really is sponge dust. 
And although it may not be showing up very well in the picture, here's some of it that fell out on the table. We definitely will need to replace this. But I already have information from an extremely experienced friend that says just take this out and that she has good success using a shoestring in its place. It's needles. It is as I suspected. Somebody, I believe in the past, has superficially removed rust because it's not just encrusted on there, but they're not smooth. And, you know, they're going to work better if they are. Neither are they ruined, and all the latches seem to work. So I think what I'm going to do is go, give them a quick going over, maybe with steel wool, and then dump them in Marvel Mystery Oil to soak while I do the rest of this. I'm very happy to see the latch working as well as that one is. And then give them another polishing. It's sort of a little bit of trouble, but it could solve so many problems. I think it's worth the effort. We found a tool that would get into that little channel and get out the debris from the old sponge. That is in pitiful shape. Here are the needles in progress. These are finished. I've spent roughly 30 seconds per needle, and I'm not attempting to get every mark off. I'm attempting to work on them until they feel smooth and until all the orangey rust is off. Sometimes it leaves a little black mark in its wake, but if it feels smooth, I'm stopping at that point. And I'm never sure how well this will show up on screen, but here are three that are untreated for comparison. And I think you can see we're we're making genuine headway, certainly in touch and smoothness, but I think you can see by looking as well. Here's my pile of partly cleaned needles. What I mean is they've had their first going over with steel wool. And now I'm going to dump them into the Marvel Mystery Oil and let them soak while I finish the other work on the machine. If you don't know about Mystery Oil, there is a video on it and information on it on our website. It's listed under something like Jack's Favorite Chemicals, and it will explain why we use it. But to summarize briefly, we use it to clean and condition the old metal. It will tend to stop the future rust, or at least inhibit future rust, to deeply lubricate these old, old latches and to clean any crud that might have gotten into them. If there's a little rust in those hinges, I cannot get to it but the oil can. However, sometimes people get mixed up and think that we recommend Marvel Mystery Oil for the general lubricant, and we do not. I do not think the machines knit well with it in there. It does a good restoration job. It's not a working lube. So after these have soaked, we will clean them off with LPS-1 and then lubricate with LPS-FG which is a silicon spray, and they will knit beautifully like that. There are also other decent knitting lubes. Those are just the ones that we like. But although we adore Marvel Mystery Oil, do not get mixed up. It's not the lubricant we use while operating the machine. This is a nice shoelace that we had on hand, but it looks a little bit too big for the channel, so we'll keep looking. We think we found a shoelace that's just right, and like Goldilocks, that's what we are looking for. Um, we have one needle saved out to test it with, and it looks as though the fit and orientation is going to be okay, but we can't know for sure till we reassemble it and try. Here are my cleaned needles. They've been soaking for about three days in the Marvel Mystery Oil, and this batch all seemed clean enough to me after I rubbed them down with this shop towel. These are these will catch easily on rough spots. So that was not only a cleaning process, it was part of the checking of their condition. This batch needs a little more steel wooling. And what I've done is use the LPS1 to spray off the needle butts as they are the part that goes through the carriage. And the, I have found, I don't care for the behavior of Marvel Mystery Oil on needles going through the carriage, but I didn't have any problem with the idea 
of leaving the tiny amount of residue that I can't wash off in that little hinge. That seems to be beneficial for the long term, so I don't see, feel any need to get rid of that. These few felt a little bit rough, and so I'm going to go over them with steel wool again and wipe them down again. Here are the last few. I've given them another steel wooling, and now they feel completely smooth on the blue shop towel. And now I'm going to do the second side. That should wash out any major amount of Marvel Mystery Oil that's still on or in those little crevices. You may remember that there was some damage to the needle channels right in this area. And Jack has repaired it. It isn't a thing of beauty, but it should be much more functional. I'll let him describe to you what he did in case you run into something like this. All right, this is a pen that, as advertised on TV, Five Second Weld, um, the reason I got it to try is because I know of this particular uh, substance being used in dentistry. They now, instead of using silver amalgam on your teeth, will put a few drops of this epoxy that is activated by ultraviolet light. So it really only takes mere seconds of exposure for it to harden. And you can see I'm tapping on that, and it is quite hard. And I'm going to show you how the pen works shortly because we're going to use a shoelace as our sponge bob in here. And what we want to do is cut the hard metal, the hard plastic tip off. And I'm going to use just a drop of this five second epoxy to coat the end. All right, I've made a tiny little mark where we want the end of the shoelace to be to fit the track. And I know it's a sponge bar, but Bob just pops out of my mouth. All right, and we're just going to apply a little bit of this. It comes out as a liquid. And what we want is for the liquid to soak into the fabric of the shoelace. So we're going to put it on as thin as we possibly can. And give it just a second or two to soak in. And I don't know if the camera can see that it's darkened it just a yeah, little bit. It, it does. Okay, so we can tell where we've been, which is always good. And this, the, the way this is set up is so cool because it's dispensed on this end, and then the ultraviolet light is on the other end of the same little pin arrangement. And I find that extremely... It's a little cool. bit stinky, but not dreadful. I'm smelling it now. Yeah. So I, I think that using it with ventilation is safer than closing yourself in the shop with it. I think so, too. Our uh, windows are open, just in case you're concerned about our brain cells. Yeah. It, huh? What? Okay. <laughs> if we fall out, it'll be on camera, and somebody can call 911. All right. It actually really only takes a few seconds for that to work. Now what we want to do is I made a mark a little beyond where we want the end to be and then I've coated an area to the mark and back and so we're going to lay it in the track and make sure we cut it exactly where it needs to be. We'll be right back. All right, here we are. We've cut our end that we treated and there's a little bit of an extension of the area past the edge of the rail right here where the screwdriver is going in so that you can get a nice smooth transition for the end to tuck down into which is why we wanted to fray check the end because this you know how they tend to pop open and expand right everything yes. like rope does i'm going right. to come over here and get another look we're using the largest shoelace that we think might possibly fit if it is too much filler in there, we will end up doing the same thing you just saw with the next size down. Yes, and we're going to treat this thoroughly with silicon so that there's no impediment to the needle sliding back and forth over the top of it. It's only to slow the needle down 
So it's a controlled movement and there's no bounce. And it, yeah, keep it from rattling. Okay, time to show you a couple of things. The needles all have to get set in their slots before you put the rail back on is one thing. And after you put the shoelace, a.k.a. sponge bar, in. And Jack's got something to show you. Yes, Catherine was moving her fingers across the mend and seeing that there was a little bit of rise in one section of it. And a beauty of this particular substance is it can be filed. You can go right through there very carefully. You don't want to get into the plastic if it were on a polymer bed machine. But this stuff is fileable, and I have a file that fits down in the channel between them so you can dress the edges of it. But anytime you use this polymer compound, it hardens very quickly, but it can be sanded. So he did do that. He smoothed it out and was careful not to damage the material of the bed. We're not sure if it's plastic or another kind of polymer, so we're being really careful. And here is the rail going back on. Its yes. positioning is pretty obvious. We right. need to remind ourselves that a screw will really a bolt goes in from the top and then a washer and a nut on the other side, right? Right. And the best thing to do is exactly what I'm doing. And Catherine has said this on camera many times. Test fit everything before you tighten anything so that you know that, that everything gets aligned right. just right. And my suggestion from many different machines that I have worked on, always start in the center and work out doing a snug fit with the screws and nuts and then come back and tighten everything up. Because if you'll notice, these two are really close together. Then there's a big gap to either side for the next screw. That's really true. I hadn't paid much attention to that. Right. So you start here with a short distance that won't bow. Then you snug these two. Then you go all the way to the ends and you snug them all up and then you go back and torque them down. All engine block heads are done that way. So we're off to do that. Yes. Of course, when you go to turn this upside down to tighten the nuts, all the needles will want to fall out. So Jack has used a coat hanger and a series of bungee cords to make a needle retainer. You don't have to do anything quite as nice as that, but you're going to need to do something. The two center ones are in now, and Jack's going to show you some tricks for seating everything where it needs to go. Right. This is the hole that the screw is in, and I'm holding the head of the screw flush to the bar with, with your my, fingertip with right. my left fingertip now you got a flat washer that has to go on there as well as the nut here's what you do get a knitting needle where you can hold this now what i'm going to do that's from one of my other standard gauge machines what i'm going to do is touch the center of the screw shank and then just drop that flat washer excuse my head while i look over yep we're right on target if not, you can adjust it just a little until it drops down on the shank of the screw. So you use the other knitting needle. It doesn't much matter what it's like, just because it had a shank that fit in there that would drop the washer into place. That's right. It'll go into the hole of the washer and the hole of the nut. But if you don't have any such thing, you could make it with any sort of yeah, household thing. Any small piece of wire. Now, what I'm doing is because it's flat and it's so easy to pinch in my hands, now I'm going to hold the nut on the shank till I can look down in there and line it up and then drop it. And if you do it just right, now it's sitting on top yeah. of the bolt. So it can there. save some time, time and like tedium. That. Well, you're never going to get your fingers down in there. No, no. Now here's the same flexible shaft and the socket. And if you go down in there very carefully and start twisting as you go that just dropped down over the top of the nut and now I've snugged it up I want to show you something real quick these are moving to and fro very nicely now but when we first got this bar tightened back down they were not because we'd actually overdone it 
it turns out it is possible to get this snug down so far. It's just pressing the needles too tightly for the carriage to move them. We aren't absolutely positive yet what the perfect amount is, but we'll keep working on it and let you know. Here we go. Not knitting yet. Don't have all of this assembly back on because it jammed and we wanted to experiment a little bit and to do some adjusting on it. But the needles are going to and fro correctly now. And you can see the position. Let me try to move it for the light. That is correct for them. We'll lay the yarn into them. And back here, let's see. The latches, when they open, come back to where I'm pointing to. A little farther back than I realized seems to be the position that the carriage, otherwise known as the cam box on this machine, places them into for use. All right, the nut in the middle, you will notice, rotates with the little rubber wheel. So that's independent of what we'll call the sinker plate attachment to the cam box. These two screws let the bar, the crossbar, move in and out slightly. These two screws, one here and one here, let these wing pieces move in and out. So this is very similar to the complex sinker plate that we find on many knitting machines. This one is just the original version of that. So you got an adjustment here for this wing section and an adjustment on the other side for this wing section, and then the whole bar will adjust in and out. So we're going to try and find out where's the optimal position. Yeah. What this one was doing was raising the needles as it came across, which put them in the wrong position to knit and made them jam in the back of the cam box. So obviously we need to put an end to that. Of course, even if your machine is perfectly clean, it's liable to be dry. Where I'm running the screwdriver is an area that the cam box cups with its little lip. It comes around the top and the bottom of this rail. So we lubricate that. And the same thing is true back here. Lube that area as well as the top. And as soon as I did that, it did start sliding noticeably more smoothly. Okay. Right. This section of the cam box underneath is the hold position. You would see that by looking down inside, and my finger is going into that section. You'll see there's a divider in this area, and this section right through here is the hold section. We've had a jam, and what I'm doing is reaching underneath here, and pulling each needle out to the whole position and let going right. over a little bit so I can get to the next needle and do the same thing. I think thing. it's pretty inevitable as you're trying to adjust one that's not working right. that you're going to try something and fail. That is correct. And it'll jam, and it's not at all obvious how you're going to release the jam. So thank goodness we have Jack. He's figured it out. Yeah, the, the thing with this is that you cannot... You have no carriage release CR position like on your brother's or the mm -mm. flip up uh, lever that lets you get into your silver reed machines. It's not there. No, so we got to work around it. And ideally, we will learn how to avoid ever having jams, but we're not there yet. Ever. Yay, we're free. Ready to try again. And we're knitting. I want to tell you a couple of things. This is Tam BB yarn, which looked to me to be about the right weight. Of course, we can't adjust stitch size. There's no adjustment here. So we just have to choose a yarn that works well. I don't yet know what the gauge is. I will measure this when I'm done. You lay the yarn over, making sure that all of the needle latches are open that's getting a little fuzzy you'll have to back off so they can see better 
And it's your job, since there's no take-up spring, to make sure there's no slack over here. But don't keep tugging on the yarn. Just get it laid in there. And if you do what I accidentally did, get a latch closed, make sure you open it. And off you go. Now I think Jack's got a couple finer points to share also. Okay, here's what we want to talk about, the configuration of this piece here, which would be the sinker plate on another style of carriage. Now, the first thing is your rubber wheel here. This one was stored with the wheel up against the side of the carriage, and I'm going to try to get it at an angle where you can see that it's got two sides flipped up and two sides flipped down, so it's not a flat surface. And what we've been doing, we I'm pretty sure this is a rubber wheel, and therefore the silicon spray reconditions it, and hopefully it'll help it to get back in its normal condition. Now, if you'll notice, the nut on the top is spinning freely, so you may have to make an adjustment on the underside of this rubber wheel there is a big slot screw and the nut and what it is is the nut is tightened down just enough to let it spin freely this one i think is adjusted correctly now these two screws here have slots underneath them this one and this one they have slots underneath them so that this plate will come out towards the cam box or away from the cam box you can see these two ends right here are the actual fork that this is slid up into and they're protruding slightly this moves the sinker plate assembly under the gate pegs toward them or away from them same thing here this screw and this screw are both there's slots underneath those also now the thing to be careful of is you have two spring-loaded arms let me tilt this right here there's one on this side and there's one on this side these two spring-loaded arms the springs are against these little casings right here for the adjustment so that's what we had to figure out is how close did we want this to the gate pegs and I had to actually change the angle right here that this piece makes because it was holding it at too close to the gate pegs when we had a rubber wheel in the right place. We're not suggesting it was made wrong. We think that was a wear and tear factor, right? Well, <clears throat> it was stored with the cam box on the bed long enough to make a mark on where this wheel sat and you can see that the wheel dips down right here so this wheel stayed pressed up against there and i'm sure it continually put pressure <clears throat> on these little spring arms and on this bracket uh again not knowing the life of a piece of equipment you don't know how it was stored where it was stored if it ever got dropped before and the older the piece of equipment the more likely that a number of things have happened over the years but we've got this one knitting quite well at this time and we're hoping it'll keep getting better when i referred to the position this was in putting tension on spring arms and brackets the spring arms is one here to one side of the wheel one here and the brackets that actually hold the wing sections on but the springs for these spring arms are anchored underneath the back of this bracket and this bracket so th if there was pressure on the arm at all it put pressure on this bracket and if it just sat there for year after year or if it was even stored in a sideways position that's what i was talking about this is the Tam BB yarn that I've been using up to now. It's a soft acrylic by the Tam company. And I would say it's a number two yarn or the very heavy end of number one. But that is not how they sell it, but I would call it number two. I have checked the gauge now, and what I'm getting 
using one claw weight is six and a half stitches and eight and a half rows per inch. I had not really decided whether it's best with or without weights. It doesn't seem to need much, and the manual doesn't suggest any. Yesterday I knitted entirely without. Today I knitted this swatch with the claw weight that you see there. Remember this spot that we mended? We've discovered something we need to share with you. It's not a good enough mend. This side is okay. That needle moves to and fro without problems. This one causes a jam, and you can see why. I'm going to try to back my finger off and jiggle it. When it gets to that point, see how much free play there is? It doesn't come straight forward and back in the channel. So this is not a tragedy, but Jack is going to need to go in and fill that area in more completely. And most likely, he'll have to make it extra and then file out the excess to get a good needle path. But the carriage is sensitive enough that that much wiggle is not allowed. We go. Look at this. This is opal sock yarn. Definitely a number one yarn. And this has a stretchy component. And our little necky is having a wonderful time. Yes, and your American Girl doll will get socks. She could, couldn't she? She could. I don't think you could fit me on this one. Uh, maybe we'll make your socks in pieces. Ah, my feet are in pieces, so. I'm really excited to find out that this will handle sock yarn with stretch in it. Because that's my favorite kind of sock yarn. And what we found out was the warping of that little rubber wheel underneath there actually requires that we keep it really well lubricated so it doesn't drag. Were it flat, it would pass smoothly through the framework of that sinker plate assembly. And since it is a little worn over time, I'm thinking it is straightening out and we'll just keep conditioning it. Coming right off the machine, this is rendering seven stitches, eight rows per inch. But two things to keep in mind. I did have a weight on it, and when you have weighted the yarn gradually, it changes its row gauge as it relaxes. Also, this kind of yarn with the polyamide component that's so stretchy changes dramatically after it's been wetted and heated. So you wash and dry it one time at least before you determine your gauge. I'm expecting I'll probably end up with more like seven and a half and nine or ten, as in seven and a half stitches and nine or ten rows per inch. But we'll see. This is a starting place anyhow. The happy news here is that it handled sock yarn so well. This is leftover from a pair of socks for myself. And if all goes well, I'll have enough to make my friend's baby a pair of booties.